the time has finally come to do the astrology podcast. This is going to be a very basic astrology podcast 101. I decided to throw this in as a last minute before the final podcast start or the actual podcast startup. JP Morgan once said, millionaires don't use astrology, billionaires do. It's widely known that some of the most successful business leaders actually pay astrologers to be on their team. And that includes our own government. They actually contract and hire astrologers to look at the United States chart. You can get so specific with your own astrology chart that you can even determine when is the best time to start a business investments. You can get so specific with astrology. It's so important that everyone taps into this for their own abundance. This has been requested from you guys for a long time. So I want to explain it in very basic terms. We're going to talk about the houses. You know, when you're born, everyone's like, oh, what's your birthday? Mine, I would be a Taurus, right? But you have an actual full-on birth chart when you're born. And what it is, is it's exactly where, you know, the second you are born, where every planet is in the sky, where every asteroid is in the sky. Literally, it is so specific. You can get so much information from your birth chart, okay? I got into reading astrology quite a few years ago. I don't know what it was, but I just picked it up really, really fast. So we're going to go into this, and we're going to talk about the basics. We're going to also talk about current transits that happened. Um, it's actually the day after, it is Saturday the 16th, and yesterday was the 15th, it was a full moon in Taurus, and there was a lot of chaos happening that day as well. So we're going to talk about how you can read your own chart and how you can take it even further. I want to start by sharing a couple of my favorite books that I use for astrology charts. One is called Cosmos and the Psych. Now this is a pretty big book. This is a little bit more advanced. It's a little bit more complicated. It has a lot of amazing information on how to read your astrology chart. And the other one that's probably the best to start with beginners is The Art of Chart Interpretation. You can pick these up on Amazon. So this is literally what an astrology chart looks like. A couple of side notes. I know that I talked about starting up the podcast and regular updates and regular um, uploads, but... My kitty cat died last week, unfortunately. I've been kind of keeping a secret from everybody, and that is that my cat was diagnosed with cancer in June. And I had him at home, and you know he had to get the tumor removed, and we surgically did that. And when the vet was in there, the vet said, you know, this could be more than just the tumor. It could also be bone cancer. He had to scrape some off of the bone. Um, and he thought maybe it had, you know, gone into his organs. So the vet basically said, take him home, put him on hospice care until, you know, we know that it's time. And he's been a fighter. He's been doing really good. He, I was shocked. He was only eight years old. Um, most of my cats live to be 16 and 22 years old. So eight feels very young to me. But, you know, we had a lot of chats, me and him, and I told him that when the time comes, I will know and he'll tell me. And uh, so it was a sad, it was emotional, emotional week. And then we had the election and it was just a high intensity time. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping with this podcast today, me talking about astrology, it can kind of explain some of the transits that are going on right now in the world. Now, first, let's talk like I'm a Taurus, but when you're reading astrology, when you're reading horoscopes, you should always be reading for your rising sign. There's a lot of different ways to read astrology. There is no right or wrong. There is Vedic versus tropical. Okay, Vedic is kind of considered the ancient way. Um, it's also very prominent in India. And then there's tropical astrology, which is more of the modernized way. So to give you an example, in the astrology that we know, I am a Taurus, that's tropical. If you read my chart in a Vedic chart, I am an Aries. So that's why some people don't read Vedic charts because it essentially will rotate all of your placements back at least one astrology sign. And that can be kind of confusing for some people. Although I have read my Vedic chart before, and I will say that honestly, it has similar traits. So I don't think there's a right or wrong way to read it. I personally read tropical whole sign houses. Not everyone reads whole signs. Whole signs basically means it makes everything look like in perfect uniform. 
And I'm also going to add a list below in the description of how you can pull up your exact chart on astro.com. There is another way that you can do it that's like the cheat easy way and that's on Cafe Astrology. But I don't think that is the most precise way to read your chart, but it's a perfect place to start. So not only is there placement, so where was the sun when you were born? Where was Mercury when you were born? Because all year long, these, you know, stars and, uh, you know, asteroids will shift into different planetary placements. You have to know down to the second you were born in order to pull up your chart. You need to know your month, date, time of day, and exact placement because depending on like if I was born in Australia versus Denver, my chart would look completely different. So you have to know the specifics of your birth, literally. There are also aspects, there's things called trines, conjunctions, oppositions, sextiles, and squares. Um, squares are something that's considered to be uh, something you have to overcome in your chart. You also have something called your big six. This is your sun sign, your moon sign, your rising sign, your Venus sign, your Mercury, and your Mars. All of these placements mean different things. Your sun is like the consciousness of your self-expression. It can also be considered your ego. It's the masculine side of you. Um, and I'm going to use myself for examples for most of these. Uh, you know, I'm a Taurus and the ego side of my Taurus is very much, I love wealth, I love expensive things, I love to shop, I love money, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's just who I am, I need an abundant life. Your moon sign is sort of your fashion, your inner side, your inner world, your habits, your behaviors, it's often not shown to people. Now I'm an exception because I show my weird side to you guys, right? Because I love paranormal and ghosts and fashion and like that my self-expression is the only way I can be in this world, which is quite rare for a lot of people. My moon is in Aquarius. I have a really weird Aquarius placement. Aquariuses are known for being kind of strange and alien-esque. They've also been known to be sort of in touch with the divine and the other side and um, always way, way, way ahead of their time. So that definitely explains who I am. That's your unconscious side and your feminine side. Now, your rising sign is your chart ruler, and it's essentially how you present yourself to the world. Um, with exceptions to two, which is Leo and Cancer, and I'll explain those. That could mean it's your personality trait, um, and it's how the outside world sees you. So I'm a Cancer rising. Cancer is ruled by the moon which I think is one of the coolest placements, and a Leo rising is ruled by the sun. Now, those two signs, since they're not technically a planet that they're ruled by, they can mute, which I think is why I bounce into sometimes my Taurus side and sometimes even my Aquarius side, because being ruled by the moon, think about the ocean, right? The ocean's constantly moving. It can be very emotional. Our moon is constantly changing into a new moon and a full moon. So Cancer and Leos can really mutate into whoever or whatever that they like. Now, when I was younger, as my Cancer rising, Cancers are the description of the crab, and I was definitely very withdrawn. They'll be the quiet ones that sit in class. I was the straight-A student that I had friends, but I, I didn't make friends easily, and I was very quiet and sat in class. So when I was a kid, um, my Cancer really stood out. Now, Cancer rising can also be known as the vampire of the zodiac. They never actually look their age, and they always look younger than they actually are. And the other really interesting thing with cancer is um, because of this, they will often be misinterpreted. And what I'm saying is that think about all the times I've talked about my paranormal side and working in um, you know, public and being a producer and working with these production companies, often they would see me walk in as this cute little blonde petite girl and they would be like, she doesn't know anything about film. So they would never take me serious. They would often offer me to do sex work or OnlyFans instead. So unfortunately, that's the sign of a cancer rising. I also have a very late placement um, on my can like the latest placement on the cancer rising um, cusp, which is almost Leo rising. So depending on how you read my chart, Venus, is how you love or what you're attracted to. It also can be self-love, self-care. Now remember with all of these placements, they're all all the planets are ruled by one sign each or something individual. And there are good aspects and bad aspects to each of those. So that's why I think it's so important for everyone to understand their chart, especially now that we're moving into the age of Aquarius. Pluto is now moving into Aquarius after the last 15 years. It's all about 
AI and aliens and tech and we're moving into the future. So this is the perfect time for you to understand your chart. So if your Venus is how you love and love, mine is in Aries, okay? This will also, for a female, whatever your Venus placement is, that will often tell you what you look for in a man or in a partner. So my Venus placement sits in the 10th house of technically Capricorn, but it's in Aries. So that means I like someone that's hardworking, who's able to manifest wealth, who's independent, who has a really big adventurous sort of personality. And if you look back at most of my exes, they all have a predominant Aries placement whether that's Aries rising, Aries moons, which is the most complicated one, or Aries suns. Your Mercury placement is your communication, your technology, and your self-expression. Mercury represents communication, okay? My Mercury is in Aries. That's why I'm not afraid to get up and talk in front of an audience, right? Like, I'm not afraid of what I'm going to say. I'm a fast thinker. It also sits in my 10th house of public career or Capricorn, which means I could get paid to be a public speaker, okay? See how this specifically can, can affect you? What you're supposed to do in this world, who you're you know supposed to end up with in love, how many children you can have. I mean, this can get specific. Once you get even more fluent in reading your chart, you can even look into things like astrocartography photography and we'll talk about that a little bit later but that can tell you where on the map in the world you would benefit from the most and oddly for me LA is one um, New York is another and Salem Massachusetts is my other one that's where my sun and my north node fall and that's interesting because I wasn't necessarily picking those based off of astrocartography. What that means is you'll have a lot of opportunities there for work, depending on the placement that you find uh, where you go to live. Mars is about action, passion. It can be about sex, drive, anger, and fighting. Um, so Mars is an interesting placement as well. It can be, it can tell you how fast you think if you're good at negotiating. Someone that has a uh, Virgo in Mars, they would probably be an overthinker and probably be a perfectionist and uh, not really know how to, you know, express themselves quite clearly. They might only think they're the only ones internally that can understand themselves because Virgos have such perfectionism. Chiron is the wounded healer, which is about deep pain. It could be past life. Um, Chiron placements are things we need to overcome in this lifetime. So depending on which house that falls in, that will be specific to you. Your north node is your life's purpose. So my north node is in the 11th house conjunct my sun. That is a, it's in Taurus. That is a very special placement for uh, fame and wealth and millionaire status. So once again, reading your chart is so important to understand that. Now, op opposition of your North Node is your South Node. That's your past life. So my past life was in Scorpio. So I often believe that that's why I also attract a lot of Scorpio placements in my life. Like most of my exes, I would say 99% of my exes always conjunct some sort of Aries placement and a Scorpio placement, always. Um, and I think it's past life. I think when I meet Scorpios, it's because of past life. Like it's an automatic click. You have something in your chart called the part of fortune or the fortune in your life. My part of fortune is in my 10th house of career. And that is a part of my stellium, which is another sign for millionaire status, wealth, success, public figure, fame. Um, having a stellium means you have more than three, three planets or more in one sign. I have two stelliums. I have a stellium in Aries in my 10th house, and I have a stellium in my fifth house of Scorpio, which fifth house represents family. Pluto is, is a difficult placement, but it's often more seen as a generational placement planet. It's about rebirth, death, destruction, reborn, transformation. Uh, so Pluto can be a complicated placement in anybody's chart. But I'm once again, remember, this is all energy. And I really believe you can overcome like, in my opinion, Pluto can represent, uh, you know, family curses or, uh, you know, family destruction that you're trying to overcome as far as ancestral trauma. Saturn is the structure and karma. It can also represent your father. The moon represents your mother. So my moon is in Aquarius in my eighth house, um, which an Aquarius can have a hard time with their mom growing up because like my mother I've shared, she's always made me feel like 
She didn't need to be around full time. I was independent. I was a good kid. I could take care of myself. So I was a little bit under emotional neglect. So this can show things in your chart. The sun can represent your father. Uranus is about change, rebellion, individuality. Neptune represents magic, dreams, fantasy, spiritualism. Jupiter represents luck and growth and money and wealth. That's an important placement. So if you have Jupiter in your second or your eighth house, um, or even your 10th or 11th house, that could bring a lot of money to your career. I have Jupiter in my eighth house, which means I'm probably going to marry someone very wealthy, very rich. It's a very lucky placement to have, especially conjunct my moon. Your midhaven is the highest point in the sky where someone's born. It's the most public part of your life. Mine is also in Aries in the 10th house of your career. So really your chart will make sense to you once you read it fame indicators are any placements in leo leo degrees so if you have any planets at the fifth degree degree the 17th degree or the 29th degree um, another major placement degree for fame is the 28th degree um, that is in cancer that can basically mean uh like uh, you know fame beyond death so something like marilyn monroe or kim kardashian zero degrees are especially cancer are also prominent for fame uh, major 10th and 11th house placements Placements are good for fame and for money. North node conjunct sun is also a big one. But there's more than just this. Remember, I'm just teaching you the basics. I want to talk about the houses and which, which houses represent what. There's 12 houses in your astrology chart. Okay, and once again, remembering I read tropical whole signs. The first house is where your rising sign will fall. That is about your appearance, your body, your impression on yourself. So anybody right now who's been a Capricorn rising with Pluto there, you're probably not the same person you were in 2008. You've probably had a total self-destruction, right? So my point is, is when we have planets move into certain houses, that's how that house will affect it. The second house is ruled by Leo, and it's about money, work, wealth, income. So it's a really important house. Now, if you have a house, like I example, I have uh, no planets in my second house, but my house that house for me is ruled by Leo. Leo is ruled by the sun. So you look for the sun in your chart and your sun will tell you how it rules that empty house. Okay. So for me, my son's in the 11th house, which is once again about groups, networking, um, and networking can be social media. It can be fame. It can be having, you know, a cult like following the third house is about thinking it's ruled by, um, Virgo. So it's about how you communicate social activities. The fourth house is important because it's about home roots, family, self care, emotions. The fifth house is also important. It's about your children, romance, love. Um, like when you have kids, it can also be a house of sex as well. The sixth house is health, fitness systems, um, your pets. So that's important sort of for your home life and how if you have illnesses, that'd be a good house to check. The seventh house is about relationships. So usually if you're looking for your partner and, and the aspects that your partner will have, go to your seventh house. So exact example for me, I have Capricorn in my seventh house. Okay. I've also been known to date men with a lot of Capricorn placements. My ex-husband had a Capricorn stellium in his second house of wealth. He had a lot of money. He was stable. He supported me in my endeavors. He, that's the things I'm attracted to, right? Is stability, is wealth, is uh, big daddy energy. That's what Capricorn represents in the seventh house. So make sure you check to find out what sign is in your seventh house. The eighth house is about, it can also be sex, intimacy, merging finances. Technically, it could be about, you know, if you're, if you marry someone rich or, or who you marry, how you marry, how that merging of finances will be depending on what's in that house. Like, for example, if you have Saturn in that house, that could be a karmic placement. So be careful who you get tied up with financially. I have Aquarius in that house. Um, I'm obviously like really into aliens and, and, and the other side. So since my eighth house is in Aquarius, my moon is there and my Jupiter. Jupiter placement can also represent how a woman finds her husband. A lot of people would be like, so what are you going to do? Meet your husband at the graveyard? Because that's kind of a dark house. It's about death. It's about taboo. It's ruled by Scorpio. It's ruled by, um, you know, technically Pluto. So are you going to go find your husband at the graveyard? For me, I mean, that could literally be someone in my field, right? Like that literally reads my chart. Okay, the ninth house is about travel, higher education. So if you go to college, ethics, if you want to see the world, check your ninth house. 
the 10th house is about career, long-term goals, structure, your public image, fame. So any really predominant placements, if you're looking for that kind of thing, wealth, fame, millionaire status, look in your 10th house too. Um, the 11th house is similar but different, but it basically means like how will people look up to you? Will you have a cult-like following? Is that something that you want? It can also just mean private groups of friends, um, social awareness. Like my North Node is there. And remember, your north node sort of represents, um, you know, your higher purpose here on Earth. So I'm often the friend, even though it's in Taurus, I'm the friend that my friends look up to. I'm the one they always come to for advice. Um, the 12th house can be a little bit confusing sometimes for people. It's a very spiritual house. If you have prominent placements in the 12th house, that can also show psychic abilities. It can show endings, healing, closure, spirituality, karma the afterlife new age all that stuff so that's why i you know these houses are just so important with how you're reading it and then you have to look at the aspects that each of them um, each of your planets have okay i have another list of fame indicators neptune in the first house neptune conjunct ascendant or ascendant in pisces if you have a leo sun moon rising or midhaven if you have a part of fortune in the second fifth eighth tenth or eleventh house if the ruler of the tenth house is somehow expecting aspecting neptune if you have sun square pluto if you have venus square pluto if you have saturn square pluto if you have personal planets midhaven ascendant north node in leo the sun in the first house the sun in the 10th house sun aspecting your midhaven and even if your sun is a dominant planet some astrologers will also say that the ninth house represents fame and the 10th house represents status i have a lot uh, my chart is actually incredibly similar to Marilyn Monroe. It's very scary how much my chart mimics Marilyn Monroe. I've actually scared some astrologers that have read my chart. Um, and so you're going to have negative aspects in your chart as well. Like for example, I have Lilith conjunct Venus. Okay. That's considered a dark placement. Your Lilith placement represents taboo things, things you do behind closed doors, the dark side of things. Um, yes, you could say the dark side of the bedroom. And, and mine's in Aries conjunct Venus, which means I'm also looking for a partner that does similar things, right? But the problem is, is that since Lilith conjunct Venus is in my 10th house of public career, Often people that I meet in the workforce, like considering, uh, let's talk about production companies and producers that I've talked about. More often than not, I have had producers ask me to do sex work, ask me to sleep with them in exchange for the series, ask me to go on OnlyFans. You, you guys have heard me rant about that. And I think it's because of my Lilith conjunct Venus in my 10th house because men that meet me in that setting will often just see the outside and they will immediately see me as like a sex symbol and, and i'm not talking public sex symbol i mean like a doll to them i even had one of my exes say that he looked at me this was towards the end of our relationship that he said that he only got with me because i was a trophy wife um, or he wanted me to be a trophy wife and put me on a shelf um because of the way i looked i was arm candy so I also am not subject to having dark placements in my chart. Lilith in Aries is already a very dark, hard placement, but now that it's conjunct Venus, and then you're putting it in your 10th house. So I've had to learn to accept and embrace the fact that most of the time with men, they're just going to see me as a sex like thing, a doll, and there's nothing I can do about it. It's just how I'm portrayed from the outside. It's very strange. But that's just what I've experienced, honestly, my whole life. And then you're throwing in a cancer rising and in a very late placement. And I, I look or I sound very childlike or innocent. And that is often just it like it wings those guys in. It just drags them in. And I'm sitting here like I didn't even do anything. That wasn't even my goal. That wasn't what I was going for. You know what I mean? So anyway, you kind of get where I'm going with this. I'm trying to explain to you guys why it's so important to check the conjunctions in your chart. Another thing, you know, I've, I've seen some astrologers be like, oh, this is just what you wrote in. There's nothing you can do about it. I don't believe that. I really believe that if there are negative aspects in your chart that you can overcome them because I have. So don't think that it's an end all be all. It can just really give you a mode, a roadmap and explain who you are um, and how the world views you, how you view yourself, some of your complications. I even have some 
aspects of my chart that show me as a filmmaker. And it just makes you feel like you're on the right track. Like, you know, you're validated in your experiences and what you're wanting. So that's why I wanted to teach you guys this. So it's so important. Every degree means something else. So let's say you have a one, a 13th or a 25 degree that's in Aries. That means that placement is also ruled by Mars. It can get so specific, guys. I mean, I don't want to get too far into the degrees because that can get really confusing. But there are critical degrees in your chart as well. Um, you can also look up synastry charts with your partner or whoever you're wanting to date or, you know, if you're married to someone, you can go on astro.com and you can do synastry charts, which will show aspects, um, you know, working with or against that partner. It can show your children, your friendships. It can show twin flames, soulmates. So for example, um, I'm a Taurus sun. One time, one time I dated a Taurus moon and an Aries sun and I was addicted to him. So oftentimes if you date someone that has a moon sign that matches your sun sign, you can have really strong synastry with that person. You'll also find out when you start looking into this, people that you've dated. Like for example, I've dated a few guys that are Aries moons. Oh, that's a hard placement for me. Like, you know, everyone hears about good aspects of each zodiac sign and bad aspects. In my opinion, Aries get a bad rap, but it's the Aries moons that are the most complicated ones. Or let me rephrase that. An unhealed Aries moon, they are the ones that are aggressive and they are moody and they will just lash out for no reason and need anger management. You have to really look at where those placements are falling and decide if that conjuncts with you or not. My dad was a Gemini rising and Gemini stellium. This man had like six placements in Gemini and we did not, we bucked heads really bad. He loved me, of course, he cared about me, he was my dad, but I've always, I, I dated a Gemini son one time and I just, I, I don't know if it's, I, I see similar aspects that my dad had. Um, he really had uh, this way of thinking that he was always right and that he wasn't willing to listen. And I, I've experienced that with other Gemini signs. I don't get along with Virgo women and I don't get along with Capricorn women. I, and you're probably looking at me like, but Crystal is a Taurus. You know, you'd think I'd get along with my fellow earth signs, but I don't. Capricorn women are very, very strong-willed, strong-working. They're usually hard workers, but I tend to notice that they don't enjoy free time en enough. So when they come hanging around me, I'm like, hey, I'm a Taurus, I'm chill, calm down. Like we don't have to always work 24 seven, like enjoy the ride as well. And eventually they get annoyed with me and, and we stop being friends. Similar with Virgo placements. I've had a lot of Virgo female friends, whether that's rising sun, moon, doesn't matter. Um, Virgo placements are analytical thinkers. They are perfectionists. And my Virgo fr female friends have always been such perfectionists to the point where they are scared to make a move. And they love me and they're attracted to me because I have so many placements in Aries and I'm really like strong-willed and fiery and ready to go. But sometimes I, they'll give me, they'll want advice from me. So I'll give them advice and I'll try to push them. And they're just so stuck in fear from their Virgo an analytics that they end up getting tired of me and they can't handle my energy and then they leave. So you'll just notice eventually that certain signs will not vibe with you and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And you know, that even goes for me with dating prominent Scorpio, Capricorn, and Aries placements. Now, Aries moons, that's that's a different story, right? But a lot of people would say that's some danger zones, right? Like Aries, why would you date an Aries? Like, you know, they, they really like can't control what they say and they're really out there. Yeah, maybe an unhealed version of an Aries, but I love the adventure that Aries bring into my life that I've always been with Aries placements. So I like, um, the push that they give me. Also remember I have five placements in Aries. So maybe that fiery energy sort of matches me, especially when I find someone with an Aries Venus, because I have an Aries Venus, you almost have like the same love language. And then uh, Capricorn placements, I they're in my seventh house. A lot of people be like, oh, Capricorns are traumatized. Like you think of Christian Grey, just my type. Anyway, maybe that was a TMI. But um, older, I usually like guys that are older, like 
it's not a bad thing, but they also need to be healed and bring balance. You have to see two sides of the coin. Scorpio placements. A lot of people give Scorpio placements a bad rap. Now I have three prominent placements in Scorpio, so maybe I'm one of those that people don't like. But the reason I like Scorpio placements is they're so good at death and rebirth. I mean, look at the stuff I've been through. You guys have seen me go through many deaths and rebirths, and I feel like I'm a pro at this point, right? Like when you go through those predominant deaths and rebirths, like me losing my parents, like it changes you, it changes your perspective. You get in tune with source, you get in tune with the other side. And um, I admire that with Scorpio placements. So I just, I've always loved those placements. I'm gonna give my opinion on some of the signs. So now Taurus is also known for being like lazy, um, but they love income. Obviously they like the luxury life. But once again, when we're talking about Taurus being lazy, I did experience that with my ex who had a Taurus moon. So I think it's the moon signs that have the, the worst side of the rep. Once again, this is the unhealed signs. Geminis are really, really intelligent. They also get a bad rap. Um, they're extremely, you know, genius. They're a mutable air sign. Can they be flighty? Yes. But if you get a healed Gemini, it's a totally different discussion. I think they'd be really great in politics. Um, or marketing because their brains just move so fast. Cancers are the crab. Um, you know, let me tell you what, Cancers and Taurus are known for having the best homes, right? Like you can see the back of my studio. Like I like things like if you want to find, you know, someone who loves their home and makes a house a home type of thing, find a Cancer or a Taurus placement, okay? Um, now Cancers can also be known for being, um, manipulative but I've actually seen that more in cancer men cancer men have a really hard time handling that placement whether that's sun rising or moon and I think it's because cancer is ruled by the moon which is a female feminine aspect and it can be quite emotionally draining and women know how to handle that where men don't um, so I've only seen that they can get crabby they can get moody but once again you're talking about the bad aspects on the unhealed side Leo's I actually don't get along with Leo men I, I really struggle with Leo men I've dated a few Leo men um, you know, I think that Leo placements um, like to be loud and be the center of attention, possibly because they were neglected at home and they were not heard at home from their parents. So when they become adults, they feel like they need to be the biggest, loudest one in the room to be seen. But the problem is, is that Leos are just so naturally perfect and beautiful anyway, you don't need to be loud. Um, they're already charismatic. And, and you know what I mean? Like, so once again, unhealed, unhealed versions. Virgos, I telling you, I love Virgos, honestly, they're so meticulous, and they make the best, you know, spreadsheets, and like the way they can think is because they're ruled by Mercury, uh, they're great at writing and journaling, but the negative side is overthinkers, they they're too scared to make moves, and sometimes it causes them to freeze, Libras, now some of my best friends are Libras, I'm, I'm an Aquarius moon, so of course, I'm going to get along with another air sign, now, Libras are interesting because, uh, once again, especially the male Libras. So you're talking, you know, rising sun, moon. Some traits I always notice with my friends, and I'm not naming any names, is they can be quite flighty. Um, they often will overcommit. They lack boundaries. Um, they are very intelligent. I really think my Libra friends are very connected to source. They're ruled by the scales. They're beautiful because they're ruled by Venus, like Taurus. Um, they're usually very romantic, artistic singers. Um, they love to bring balance, but sometimes they, they like to bring balance so much to the point where they will sacrifice themselves. And I've seen that with almost all of my Libra friends. So if you're a Libra out there, please remember that you need to come first. You know what I mean? Now, I've also noticed that Libra men, Libra men, um, are... S-H-I-T talkers, and they often will be very, very two-faced. So um, they will present themselves in public as one version, and then behind closed doors, they'll be a completely different person, and it's often very dark. And I don't mean dark in a Christian gray sort of way. I mean in a dark way of like, stay away from me. In fact, I think an unhealed Libra man can be more dangerous than an Aries, Scorpio, or Capricorn combined, okay? I think that somehow they fly under the radar because they're so good at negotiating, and they're good at sort of um, throwing the ball off onto someone else. Scorpio placements. 
you know, I don't know why they get a bad rap because they will just tell you how it is. You know, like think of Ryan Reynolds or um, what's the other one that's really big, Ryan Gosling. Um, they're very mysterious. They're magnetic. They're powerful. Um, they're usually very spiritual. Anyone with a prominent Scorpio placement is going to be somehow connected to source on the other side, um, which is what attracts me. Now, remember Pluto is ruled by Mars. So that's a dark placement. Um, but you know, they're ruled by the eighth house, um, which is sexual intimacy. So t sometimes they can be seen as sexual creatures, even though they're not necessarily trying to be seen as sexual. A lot of people say, oh, be careful of the Scorpio. They'll sting you with their tail when they're mad. Yes, they will. But thank God they at least communicate that and they don't fly under the radar like a Libra. You know what I'm saying? Sagittarius. I was ruled by, I was raised by my mother who is a Sagittarius son. I love Sagittarius placements. They can be a lot for people to handle. They definitely, um, they're, they're the archer, uh, their adventure, higher learning, free spirited, unfiltered. Um, you either like a Sag or you don't. I've dated Sages. My mom was a Sag. Um, I love Sagittarius. They, they live life literally to the extent of like, as far as you can push it, go. They don't care, but they don't do it really hurting. I've noticed a lot of Sag or Terry placements are just hilarious. Like a couple of my exes and even my mom for that matter were, they, they were so good at talking and philosophical insight and, um, they'd be great comedians in my opinion. Okay, Capricorn placements, the goat. Um, I've never dated a Capricorn sun, um, but I have dated Capricorn risings before. They, they represent what a Capricorn, what do you think a Capricorn represents? Hardworking, career, public image, down to earth, grounded, money, right? Like, you know, Taurus is ruled by Venus, so we like luxury, right? If you have any placements in Taurus, especially your Venus or, or Mercury, you know, if you have a Mercury in Taurus, because Taurus is ruled by the throat, people like to listen to you. You'd probably be really good at like podcasting or public speech, right? Capricorn, it's just, it's the same, but like to an extreme, in my opinion. They don't necessarily want to show it off the way Taurus does. Like in my, when I, you know, I'm a millionaire, you're going to know I'm a millionaire and be proud of it because I worked for it. But a Capricorn is just going to stockpile the money. They're going to stock it, stock it, stockpile it, right? Like you're not necessarily going to know how much money they have. And all of a sudden, like, oh yeah, by the way, I have 10 million in the bank. And, but you, you know, oftentimes you'll see Capricorns that really, really struggle with um, having lifelong friends or friend groups because they tend to put, you know, they're, they're workaholics. They put their work first. And I think that's great. And I admire it because obviously it's in my, my seventh house of relationships. However, um, don't forget to live, Capricorns. Aquarius, oh man. I mean, Aquarius gets a bad rap, okay? Like, Aquarius gets a bad rap because they're so weird, okay? And it's true. I'm an Aquarius moon, so I'll take it. I like that compliment. That sounds like something an Aquarius would say, okay? Aquarius is the water bearer. So a lot of times people hear the word aqua, Aquarius, and they think it's a water sign. No, 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 it's an air sign, and we hold the water. So a lot of people will say with Aquarius is like, oh, y'all don't have any feelings. Like, you're so cruel and mean, and you can shut that off, and, um, you know, you can shut people out with no explanation, and, um, you know, you have no feelings. I don't know. You know, we're the water bearer. So the problem is, is that, you know, even me, I don't see things on an individual level. I see things on a global scale. So when I'm upset about something, I'm not thinking about just, you know, my community, my relationship. I'm thinking about it on a, a greater scale. And that can be very over because we're the water bearer. We're holding it together for everybody. We're holding the tears, okay? So when it gets overwhelming, do we shut it off? Absolutely. I can shut off those emotions like a light switch. However, I'm also ruled by a cancer rising, which is in a very emotional female the ultimate feminine archetype. So imagine what it's like to be ruled by, you know, the moon. My sun is in Venus, which is femininity as well, right? Aphrodite. And then my moon is little Aquarius moon is like shut it all down. So you have to find balance between all of it. I mean, I, I think Aquariuses are beautiful people. They're about humanitarianism. They're about individualism. It's, uh, it is not shocking when you talk to Gothic people or alternative people, ask them if they have Aquarius placements. Just ask them. Because most Gothic and alternative people will have Aquarius somewhere prominent in their chart. Even if it's a Mars. It doesn't matter. 
just look at their chart. Once again, the bad side is knowing that they can shut shut things off. Now, Pisces is interesting. I don't. I've never had a lot of Pisces friends. Um, but you know, Pisces get a rep for being, having their head in the clouds. They're usually very, very psychic, very dreamy, empathetic, ethereal, connected to source. And sometimes so far connected to source, they become a daydreamer and they can't focus on the 3D. But I don't know. I, once again, you're talking about the unhealed traits, right? We also go by cardinal signs. The cardinals are the Aries, the Cancer, the Libra, and the Capricorns. The mutable is... The Gemini, the Virgo, the Sagittarius, and Pisces, and you have the fixed signs, which is Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and, and Aquarius, okay? And um, placements for psychic abilities, 12th house, moon, our sun, Pis Pisces rising, Cancer rising, or Scorpio rising. Honestly, the moon, uh, I'm sorry, the water signs, so Cancer, Pisces, Scorpio, any prominent placements in those you're probably going to have some sort of connection to source or divine and have psychic abilities because those they're, they're just so mutable between each world. Now let's talk about right now, you know, currently Pluto is in Capricorn. It has been there since 2008. So I want you to think back to 2008. I had this dream that my guides the other night were like, you've got to talk about this before Tuesday because people need to hear this. There's a lot of changes happening globally right now. I, I mean, at this point, I think that we all know where I stand politically. I don't think I need to say it because I have been fighting rich, white, powerful men in Hollywood for God knows how many years. And I definitely wouldn't be voting for one. That's just where I'm at. I think that's been pretty clear from day one. Um, you know, but moving forward from that, there, there's been this uproar of like, uh, you know, women concerned that we're going backwards. And here's the thing, when we're talking about Pluto, in Capricorn, where it's been since 2008, okay? That's got to be one of the hardest placements for Pluto to be. And that's because Capricorn's a difficult sign in itself, okay? So wherever Capricorn is in your chart, that is where your life has been unsteady since 2008. So let's talk about what Capricorn is again. Traditional, down to earth, um, hardworking, known for being workaholics, extremely loyal, off, often exhibiting, you know, um, the ability to be steady and grounded, right? So if Pluto, the planet of destruction, is in your house of Capricorn, what do you think is going to happen? So some tough placements for, you know, Pluto and Capricorn. If you, obviously Capricorn rising is going to be the hardest one. So if you had Pluto in your first house as a Capricorn rising, you probably do not recognize yourself since 2008. If you look back at 2008, you probably don't know who, who that person is anymore. If you have Capricorn in your second house currently or in your eighth house or even, yeah, I would say mainly second and eighth house, that would cause some money financial issues. Now, it might have been okay, but it might have been rocky, right? So that'll explain that. Um, if you had Capricorn in your fourth house, fifth house, or seventh house, I am a Cancer rising. And I had Capricorn in my seventh house and it was horrible. I lost 90% of the people in my life. They, they passed away and crossed over um, since 2008, including my two dogs and my cat just passed. Actually, I had even more pets than that. Um, but it's a lot. It, it's been a lot. So if you're a cardinal sign, Aries, can't, Aries rising, Cancer rising, Libra rising, Capricorn rising, on Tuesday, you're going to feel a major, major shift. Um, you're probably going to be given some sort of award or a present from the universe for passing this test. Um, I think, once again, this has got to be one of the worst placements for Pluto to be, and we just decided to incarnate together and get through it. So congratulations, kids. We made it. I mean, look at me, even with my, my seventh house of relationships with Capricorn. Not only did my parents die, my mom was killed, but also my cat just died a week ago. So it's like those last final weeks... Pluto's going to get that last zinger in. So let's all just really stay calm until Tuesday. I had this dream that I needed to tell you guys about this. And uh, one of my friends, actually two of my friends texted me yesterday and were like, what's going on with the plants? I just crying constantly. They are cardinal rising signs. So I was like, that was my sign from my guides. Like, yes, I need to do this. Uh, we need to talk about this. Now doing your birth chart. Um, let's talk about let's talk about the age of Aquarius. Okay. So we're about to Pluto's moving into Aquarius for the next 20 years. The ironic part is we just talked about, you know, aliens are in the water, right? We saw that aliens are in the ocean that was on CNN or whatever it was. They were having this huge meeting, um, yesterday or the day before, uh, beginning of November, uh, mid, mid November. Remember Aquarius is about 
inventive AI, the future, aliens. I'm preparing you guys to understand that the next 20 years of our life is going to be hitting the fast button. Things are never going to look the same as they did before. Everything's about to change in our favor. It's going to be good. Capricorn is about, you know, the earth side of destructing things where Aquarius is about the collective. It's a collective change. We're doing things together. And remember when I talked about the fates is we can't go backwards. There's a lot of females I've seen online that are scared. We're going to go backwards and women are going to lose rights. No, 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 we can't. We can't go backwards. We can only move forward, especially with Pluto going into Aquarius. There is no choice. The uh, equality is coming. If it, everything's changing, we have to get through this last sort of little tower moment in order to get into the age of Aquarius. And we're there right now. So don't be shocked if we see even more global changes like hurricanes and uh, earthquakes. And the earth is sort of giving that last little purge before um, this new AI inventive way of looking at things. It's going to change. Equality is going to change. You're going to see a lot of women world leaders step up it's going to be a lot of it's going to be the age of the divine feminine um and this i'm not talking just to women right now if you're a guy and you've been listening to my podcast and i know you've been hearing my healing journey but this is all, also not only activating the divine feminine in yourself but the divine feminine in others when you change and shift your own energy because all of us are made up of divine masculine and feminine energy all of us are okay but you're going to see a lot of women step up as world leaders, military officials, like there's going to be a huge change. And I heard one of my psychic friends, I talked to her the other day, and she said this really prominent thing to me. She said, women would never send their children to war. A woman would never bear a child for nine months and then send them to war. That's been about all man's ego. All of man's ego has been how much money can we make in exchange for our bearing arms and gun distribution and wars and oil. We make money off all that and mining and gold. And if women were ruling the world, it wouldn't be that way. Of course, we need money, but it needs to be more of a global way of looking at it versus of I and me. You're going to see a lot of the one percenters drop and it's going to even back out because now the lower class, middle class are starting to learn what it's like to create abundance. There's enough wealth and money for all of us. You don't need that mindset of they versus me, me versus them. It is everyone can be abundant. You just have to shift your reality because now we're learning to connect with source. The veil is going to start thinning hardcore to the other side. I wouldn't be shocked if communicating with the other side becomes so much easier because intellectually we're going to start opening up to source and the 5d with this new shift on the new earth as long as you've been doing the work and the self-reflection and the healing you're moving into the new earth i think i talked about this before we talked about the dolores cannon's theory of the earth was splitting into two you got to either make the decision to go with the new earth or the old earth the old earth will sort of self-destruct and the new earth will become ai um, it will become, and don't fear AI, because I really think eventually AI is going to be us directly connecting to our spirit team and our higher self. But don't go into it with fear, because remember, you get to choose and pick your reality. So we're about to have a major shift that we've never seen on this planet before. It's going to feel rocky at first, it's going to feel unsteady, but it's going to be beautiful because then after the 20 years that it's in Aquarius is going into Pisces, which is dreamy and intuition and definitely connecting with the other side. That is total spirituality. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to start seeing world peace soon after this last purge happens. So everybody strap in and hold on. Keep doing the inner work that you need to do. The last thing I want to talk about is astro cartography. Um, you can find your astro, you literally type in Google astro cartography chart. I think it'll pull it up on astro.com as well. I will put a little blurb in the description so that you can know how to pull up your chart the way I read it, because I think it'll be the easiest way for you to interpret it. Now, please read your chart and don't get discouraged over negative things that are in the chart. Okay. Everyone has aspects that are not perfect. You can overcome them. I, mean, I even have aspects in my chart. I'm like, oh, yeah, I definitely used to be like that, but I've overcome it. Remember, everything is energy. Use this as a permission slip. 
to open up and learn who you are, learn yourself, learn some of the things you need to change, understand, you know, the, the human that you want to become while you're here on this incarnation. Um, we can always do a more in-depth astrology read later on, but I just want to do this to get you guys going and understand Tuesday is a very big day. November, I think it's November 19th. Hang on a second. Pluto will enter Aquarius on November 19th, 2024, and it will remain there until March 8th of 2043. This is a significant event in astrology. It only The last time Pluto was in Aquarius was 248 years ago, which was during the French Revolution and the American Revolution. So that should give you a little hint of what is to come. Major, major changes. We cannot go backwards. We can only go forwards. There will be a societal change. Pluto's return to Aquarius could usher in a new wave of societal transformation, similar to the Semitic shifts that occurred during the American and French Rev Revolutionary Wars. Technological advancements. Pluto in Aquarius will lead to new technological advancements, such as emerging from AI and the evolution of social media. This will be a very powerful shift. Pluto in Aquarius will lead to a shift in power of the collective gaining more of the influence and power rather than a single person the focus and ease on each accessibility will shift away from the traditional achievement and towards the focus of creating with ease and accessibility for the people pluto's transition pluto's transition through aquarius could also be an invitation to question outdated transitions and systems what needs to be destroyed in order to be rebuilt consider your systems in your life still that serve you and ones that do not remove embrace this transformation and the intensity behind it lean into the breakdown phase this, so that you can rebuild something better so let's all just stay positive and keep healing and keep going there are some major changes ahead. And this is an astrological change. This is not an individual change. This is happening as a collective, as a society. And really, this is a perfect time on, you know, Tuesday, you're, you're going to feel a little weird. You know, I went out today. Today is uh, Saturday, November 16th. And it was eerily quiet. Like I had to go to the grocery store. I was sending Kat a Christmas present early. Um, so I had to drop it off at the post office. I had some Depop orders I needed to get out. P.S. Shameless plug. Go follow my Depop shop because I'm selling a ton of stuff on there that I haven't even worn. I used it for modeling and it's like really cheap on there. But anyway, I'll, I'll link that below. I went out and it was eerily quiet. And I think it's because of this transit. I think everyone can feel it happening. The full moon was yesterday, which was another purge. Um, we had Mars that was in retrograde since June, which was another purge. Venus just moved into Capricorn, which is good because that brings ushers in new stable love. Be fearless in this new era. Tuesday marks a change in your life. You get to choose. Do you choose to stay with the old earth or do you choose to change your life for the better and make change? What is it that you've always wanted to do? What is your highest passion? I wake up every day and I follow my highest passion. What is that for you? What is that? Start doing it now. The time is start making a plan so that when Tuesday hits, you can hit the ground running because everything's about to change. Start bringing in abundance into your life and we're going to make it through this. Make sure you like, follow, subscribe and follow me for more and let's get going on the new podcast, okay? I'm done with Capricorn and Pluto, y'all. I've had enough death in my life and destruction. My cat's gone now. I'm like, y'all. I am done, y'all. Done. Love you.